Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kobi Janabala Bhagiri Varadhadi Kobi Janabala Bhagiri Varadhadi Yasoda Nandana Prajajana Ranjana Yasoda Nandana Prajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachadi Jamuna Tira Banachadi Jaya Radha Badaba Kunjabi Hadi Kobi Janabala Bakiri Varadhadi Kobi Janabala Bakiri Varadhadi Yasoda Nandana Prajajana Ranjana Yasoda Nandana Prajajana Ranjana Jamana Tira Vanachadi Jamuna Tira Banachadi Banachadi Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hare Hare 
जय राध मधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध मधव कुंज बिहारी Vishnupadaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Jinamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharani Nivasesha Sundiwari Pashtatale Satarani Hare Krishna um, Can someone get a Bhagavad Gita for me? Thank you. Um, is anyone coming today for the first time? We've all been here before. Oh, seasoned devotees. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So I wanted to talk today about, the, I believe it's chapter 13, Nature, the Enjoyer, and Consciousness. I believe that's the chapter, right? And now that's chapter 14. Okay. Forgive me here. Text number nineteen. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya This is text number 19 Iti Chetram Tata Gyanam Choktam Sumasata Bad Bhakta Etad Vrednaya Advaivayo Papadyate Translation Thus the field of activities, the body, knowledge, and the knowable have been summarily described by me. Only my devotees can understand this thoroughly and thus attain to my nature. Purport by Śrīla Prabhupāda The Lord has described in summary the body, knowledge, and the knowable. This knowledge is of three things, the knower, the knowable, and the process of knowing. Combined, these are called vijnana, or the science of knowledge. Perfect knowledge can be understood by the unalloyed devotees of the Lord directly. Others are unable to understand. The monists say that at the ultimate stage, these three items become one. But the devotees do not accept this. Knowledge and development of knowledge mean understanding oneself in Krishna consciousness. We are being led by material consciousness, but as soon as we transfer all consciousness to Krishna's activities and realize that Krishna is everything, then we attain real knowledge. In other words, knowledge is nothing but the preliminary stage of understanding devotional service perfectly. In the 15th chapter, this will be very clearly explained. Now, to summarize, one may understand that verses 6 and 7, beginning from Mahabhutani and continuing through Chaitanya Driti, analyze the material elements and certain manifestations of the symptoms of life. These combine to form the body or the field of activities. And verses 8 through 12 from Anmanitvam through Tattva Ganartha Darshanam describe the process of knowledge for understanding both types of nor of the field of activities, namely the soul and the super-soul. Then verses 13 through 18, beginning from Anadi Matparam 
and continuing through Vidyasarvasya Vishtitam, describe the soul and the Supreme Lord, or the Super Soul. Thus three items have been described, the field of activity, the body, the process of understanding, and both the soul and the Super Soul. It is especially described here that only the underlying devotees of the Lord can understand these three items clearly. So for these devotees, Bhagavad Gita is fully useful. It is they who can attain the supreme goal, the nature of the supreme Lord, Krishna. In other words, only devotees, and not others, can understand Bhagavad Gita and derive the desired result. So, in this world we are covered by illusion, and that illusion begins from, I am this body. And we are given this body and put into illusion for a particular purpose. And that is to allow us to fulfill our desires and experience the world uh, in different ways and find different ways to find enjoyment. And so there are 8,400,000 species of life in which to allow us full facility to enjoy ourselves. And each particular species has something that they're good at, or something that they enjoy. Um, for example, there are some animals called ant eaters. And ant eaters like to eat ants. And their body is constructed in such a way that they are allowed to eat those things. They have a long tongue, they can stick it down to the, the ant nest and eat ants. Okay. Can you do that? <laughs> like they say. Right? Um, some animals are like uh, eagles and other predatory birds. Um, they have extremely good eyesight. I mean, like they have built-in binoculars. They can see for mi five miles up. So five miles up. Now, that's as high as an airplane flies. Okay? Can you look out the window of the airplane and see a little tiny animal that you want to, you know, eat that might be, you know, a prey? Uh, probably not. Right? But they have that ability. And so different animals enjoy in all kinds of different ways. When we become a human being through the process of a spiritual evolution, it's really not spiritual. What I, what I really mean to say is that Darwinian evolution uh, is not correct. The bodies don't evolve. What happens is the bodies are there, and the soul is taken from this life into the body of another species after the present life is over. So... Even though we don't uh, see what's going on, we have to take the help of the scriptures and what, what the, the Vedas say about what's actually going on. Okay. So for the non-devotees, okay, all the non-devotee can do is look. And someone else comes along and says, oh, this is the explanation. Right? No, no, no. The next person comes along. Now, this is the explanation, right? And each, if you go to the, the colleges and the universities, every year they have to revise the textbook because last year's knowledge is obsolete and we have to change it to uh, accommodate what we know now, what we didn't know yesterday, right? So this is their process of knowledge. That one blind man is saying, follow me, and all the other blind people are following him and they're all falling in a ditch, right? But if you really want to understand what we are, who we are, where we've been, what this world is, and if there's a goal of life, then we have to go beyond someone, some ordinary person. If I have some opinion, or you have some opinion, you know, we... we decide, well, I'll take a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and we come up with some philosophy of life. That's not very helpful for the same reason that 
we are using our senses to try to understand reality. Okay? We do some experiments. If you want to call yourself a scientist, if there's any scientists around, I grew up a scientist. I was going to be an engineer. To try to understand the nature of things, we do some, we, we look at something, some phenomenon, make some speculation about it, invent some experiment to prove or disprove uh, what our speculation is, and then come to a conclusion. And on and on through the process of scientific uh, investigation, um, you know, like they say, it's not the, it's not the goal, it's the journey, right? <laughs> they never come to a, a final conclusion because something, somebody else is going to come along and, and say, no, that's not true. Or you've got it half right, but you haven't got the whole thing. They have those atom smashers, right? This, uh, I think it's C-E-R-N, CERN, some place in Europe. They have an atom smasher, and they, they have this huge machinery that, that covers, like, you know, blocks and blocks and blocks, a huge area, that they accelerate particles around in a, in a circle, and they crash into each other. And they, they keep finding finer and finer particles, the, the medical people are, are studying the cells. And in the, at first they think, well, it's, you know, it's not really that complicated. It's just sort of a little, you know, little bubbles, a little like bubble wrap or something, you know, just little things. And the more they study it, it's finer and finer and finer and finer. They, there's more and more to, to discover about it. So where, well, how, how, do we, how, how can we know anything? With, with, uh, with certainty, with 100% certainty. We could simply uh, expect that we're going to do scientific experiments until the end of time. That will not get you to the final result. Suppose you want to know who your, you know, who's your dad, who's your father. Well, they have, you know, scientific experiments. that you take the DNA of, you know, of every man on the earth and, you know, deduce that, you know, According to ten hundred trillion to one, that this person is most likely her father. <laughs> that's that's the long way around. That's like you know, touch your nose. <laughs> you touch your nose like this. You know, how to go like this. if you want to know who your father is, guess what? You ask your mom. That's the easy way. Uh, I mean, assuming that she tells you the truth, or uh, that she knows. So, to understand who we are and where we came from cannot come from someone in this world because we were not there when we were created. We don't, we don't know, we weren't there when our bodies were conceived, right? So in order to understand the absolute truth, we have to go to someone who can teach us and who has perfect information. So we have the spiritual master, the guru, and we have the Vedas. And the original guru is Krishna. So Krishna is the Adi guru. He's the spiritual master. And then we have from Krishna a disciplic line down through the ages, uh, passing this Vedic knowledge from master to disciple down to the present age through in our line, we have Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appeared 500 years ago, um, who is Krishna himself. And we have the deity, of course, on their, on their altar here. So the process of knowledge is coming down. We're getting superior knowledge from a higher source, rather than trying to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and you know, do experiments to try to find the absolute truth. But what people don't understand, of course, we're very oriented that way. Everything is DIY, right? Be your own guru, right? Just call yourself a guru, you know, put on the T-shirt. Um, but to become a spiritual master is not so easy and it's not so cheap, okay? If someone is a spiritual master, he has to have his own spiritual master and he has to have past the test. Just like when you go to college, you get a degree. 
So you can't just, you know, say, well, I, I've studied the same books, I've, you know, audited the classes. No, there has to be someone with the final say. Okay, this person is qualified, um, he gets a, the degree, you know, you know, everything is bona fide, right? So if you want to study something, okay, even if you go to a mundane school, you got to have a teacher. You have to have someone, okay, if you want a degree in engineering, for example, okay, you have to take so many math classes, right? And you have to take classes on, you know, structural, uh, uh, structural engineering and materials, what you're going to build something out of, and specific classes that you will need to know, the, the material that you'll need to know in order to be a competent engineer or scientist. So in spiritual life, of course, every, a lot of things are analogous. If you want to understand yourself, then you have to go to someone who has already been there, who has already realized it. Otherwise, it's just like you know, somebody blind man. I, you know, I think I know something, and I teach you, and you teach somebody else. But you know, go back to the beginning. <laughs> Who's where, you know, where are you getting your information from? Okay. So if you want to understand the absolute truth, then you have to approach a spiritual master. You have to have someone who's going to, going to teach you. And that begins uh, human life. Okay. As, as we are born, we don't know anything. We have to... Uh, go to school, we have to learn about the world. But if you want to understand the absolute truth, if you want to understand what this life is and who we are, okay, that inquiry means that you have now become a human being. Because the animals don't ask that question. They can't. And the only thing that human beings have over the animals is the superior intellect and the capability, at least the, the possibility of understanding who we are, and is there a supreme being? What is our origin? Where do we come from? Um, and what is the nature of, of this world? If you ask a, a cow on the way to a slaughterhouse, um, he knows something's up, but he doesn't know how to get out of it, okay? So a human being, if he doesn't ask the question, why am I suffering, what am I, what am I here for, then you really haven't come to the human platform yet. Okay, you might be very qualified in some other way. You might be a big scientist or, or whatever you might be. But until you come to inquire about, you know, who is God or is there a God? That's the question that human beings can ask. Animals cannot do that. Okay. So what Krishna is explaining here is that there is another person we, we're not, we, we don't see with our eyes. We, we can't see God. And there's a reason for that. But we can't, with their eyes, are, we don't see spirit. So we have to learn from the higher source that there is such a thing. And that requires to have a little bit of faith. Right? You go to school. You have a little bit of faith that the person standing in front of the class is, knows what he's talking about. And as you attend the lectures and as the days go by, you realize that, okay, I'm, I'm learning something here. I'm, I'm making some progress. So if you have a little bit of faith that I'll, let me, let me look at this book. Somebody's offering you the book. We find a, a, one of Srila Prabhupada's books. Yeah, what is this book? I gave you five bucks or I, you know, whatever. And so, with a little preliminary faith, it's okay. Maybe there's something here, okay. And maybe there's a God. Maybe there isn't. Well, let's 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 see, okay. So then, with that preliminary faith, as you begin to read and begin to hear about Krishna consciousness, then things start making some sense. Huh? I've never heard this before. I wasn't taught in school, right? We all. Most of us got a pretty good education, public education or otherwise. But I never heard anything about Krishna. Who's Krishna? I don't know anything. Um, I'm not this body. 
oh, huh? I'm, I'm, you know, that's that's what I am. I'm, you know, a white Protestant. You know, my name is this. I was born in this country or that country. Um, I, I, I know all about myself. Are you telling me I don't know anything? <laughs> okay, so it's a revolution. It's something new. It's the it's the the road. Um, not often taken. Okay, so how many people are in San Diego, and how many people are sitting in this room learning something about Krishna consciousness? So uh, congratulate yourself. Pat yourself on the back. Say thank you very much to yourself for uh, taking the step to begin the process of becoming a real spiritual being, not just human being, spiritual being, because we are not this body. The body comes and goes, okay? Um, I remember a few years ago, I had to clean up my mother's garage that she had passed away. And so, you know, one of, one of her drawers or in a few boxes, she had <laughs> every, you know, program for any, you know, activity, all the finger paintings, the pictures, the news clippings of, of all her children, right? So we, we have all these experiences, okay? So when we look back and see that picture, but that picture doesn't look exactly like me, sort of, you know, reasonable facsimile, right? When I was a kid, you know, and I had darker hair and, you know, I wasn't so <laughs> pear-shaped <laughs> as today. So the body's changing. We all know that. Um, a child can understand intellectually. But because we are so conditioned and we want to be this body, so if somebody says you're not that body, well, okay, I can understand it, but we're still attached, okay? If you're driving a car and somebody bangs into your car, you get upset. Oh, you hit me, <laughs> right? You hit me. But you haven't hurt yourself, You've, your car's hurt. So we identify with the car, we identify with the body, and all of our things. Ask me how I know. Okay. So the real truth is that because we're identifying with these things, we are in illusion. We are participating in the illusion of maya. Okay, maya is the energy of Krishna, persona personified. Okay, she's so called Maya. And Maya is a pure devotee of Krishna. Okay, she has no other desire. She wants to do what Krishna wants her to do. And her job is to keep us engaged. That when we are in the world, kind of like a, this world is compared to a, being like a prison. And she's sort of like the commandant, right? The, the, the warden. Okay. And her job is to keep us from bothering Krishna. We have a, a separate place for those people who are, do not agree voluntarily to participate in Krishna's world. Okay? And we're here to engage in our world. Come into my world, right? I'm the enjoyer and, and, and everyone else is there to do something for me. And that might include, you know, making a show or becoming, you know, a very uh, a philanthropic person, a very empathetic person, uh, love others, right? But the whole idea really to be recognized. We all want recognition. We want somebody to, to think uh, uh, we're special, right? So in this world, then there's envy because, wow, someone else is getting recognition. Why not me? Well, you know, how, how, you know. So we're all in this competition, kind of like king of the hill. I, I want to be the person that's in charge. I want to be the person who is the enjoyer and the proprietor and be known as everyone's best friend. But that's God's position, okay? And we may not even think like that. But I'm, I don't think I want to be God. Now that, you know, that's a little out of my pay grade. But if you examine the position of God, and that's in his world, in Krishna's world, Krishna is the enjoyer. 
and everyone in the spiritual world enjoys doing things that please Krishna. And for us in this conditioned life, it's a little hard to understand because we're used to doing it the other way around. How, how by pleasing someone else do I get pleased? Right? We get in some relationship, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, right? But we're really not sure, we do something, we're not sure, or, or maybe they're disappointed, we're not devoted enough. Or, that's always something, something disappointing. But it's not like that with Krishna. It, by serving Krishna, it's, it's sort of like watering the root of a tree, right? Or putting food in the mouth with the ultimate idea of sending it to the stomach. So, the person who's serving Krishna is feeling reciprocation. It's like, yeah, this feels right. I feel, I feel that I'm becoming happy by serving Krishna. But for a non-devotee, it's hard to understand because you haven't got that experience. And it's a little bit esoteric. Um, how do I serve Krishna? How do I know I'm pleasing Krishna? Okay, um, I think I'll please Krishna by, uh, you know, cutting your head off, <laughs> or whatever, whatever it might be. And people write books. Oh, God spoke to me, right? And uh, you know, he said to do this and such, <laughs> right? <laughs> but then it turns out that um, they just create havoc. So devotional service is not something you make up. Devotional service, or doing something to please God, has to come from the representative of God. We can't go to God directly. Even I grew up a Christian, and it was well understood that you have to have an interme intermediary. You have to have someone that is going to bring you, right? You don't just barge in on the President of the United States, you know, barge past the secretaries and all that. No, you, you have to go through the proper channels. Okay, and what to speak of the Supreme Person, God Himself. We have so many stars in the sky. We have so many, there are so many universes according to the Vedas. Billions and billions of universes. And He's God for every single living entity in each of those universes. He's a pretty big guy, pretty, pretty important, okay? So, what to speak of understanding something about his personality? All the esoteric things that go into being a person. You can say, well, you know, Mr. President, you know, we, we, we say, you know, very reverentially and very respectfully, oh, Mr. President, this and that, okay. But to understand the nature of what he likes and what he doesn't like. Okay? There's a process for, in, in, oh, I'm going to make up a word, to ingratiating ourselves, becoming the person that he would want to be with. Right? If you want to understand, you know, what a person's like, who, who then you have to go through someone, you have to understand and be trained by someone to understand what he likes and what he doesn't like so that at least you don't disturb him by doing something <laughs> that he doesn't like, right? So that falls to the spiritual master. The spiritual master is the most confidential servant of Krishna. So he knows Krishna. He's in a relationship with Krishna. Srila Prabhupada has that relationship with Krishna. Okay? So, in this life, because we have our senses, we have our bodies, we have our life, we have to work, and we have families, and uh, different situations. Okay? How do we become closer to God? How do we ingratiate ourselves? How do we surrender to Krishna? That means we have to go to someone who is going to give us that information and is going to basically connect us to Krishna. That is the spiritual master, the guru, okay? The guru doesn't have any other business, right? He's not 
guru because he's trying to get followers so he can have a lot of money and, you know, uh, enjoy. His only business is to tell you about Krishna, to enlighten you about Krishna consciousness. And if you study Srila Prabhupada, you'll see that that was his only business. Okay? So, the process is that first you have to have some faith. Okay? You read something from Srila Prabhupada's books or you hear from a devotee. And then gradually by following their instruction, then your faith builds. You become more and more convinced. Right? Ultimately, if you're very serious about it, you will want to be, you will want to find someone who can guide you, become your spiritual guide. Okay? Srila Prabhupada has written all these books for us, but physically, he's not manifest. We have a, our Murti, Srila Prabhupada, sitting here. He's actually present, but in the beginning, it's a little difficult to understand. So, if you read through the Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada said, I'm, I'm actually, you're already initiated, in a sense, okay. But in another sense, we still need to have someone who can guide us. But as they say, you know, if you love me, love my dog, right? If you, so I, I love you, but I get rid of that dog. <laughs> They're not very happy, right? So... You want to find someone who is dear to Krishna, okay, and someone whose life is de dedicated to the service of Krishna, and that person, if you get initiated by that person, and you follow their direction, then Krishna is very pleased. Okay. So that's the system. Okay, Krishna doesn't say, he doesn't just show up and say, here I am, uh, serve me or else, <laughs> you know. He makes a system by which he exalts his devotees. Krishna is more pleased when you please his devotee than he is someone tries to please him. That's another secret. There's a lot of secrets to this, to this process. And because we're conditioned, we has sometimes have to go through various tests and various uh, 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 challenges which go to prove or, you know, show that we need to make some more progress, okay? Pure devotional service is unmotivated. It is only for the pleasure of Krishna, for nothing else. If, if, if it's uncomfortable for us, but Krishna wants it, then the pure devotee will do it. For example, Srila Prabhupada came to this country on, uh, unaccompanied, with practically no money. But his spiritual master gave him the service of preaching to the English-speaking English -speaking people in the West. So was it comfortable and convenient for him to do so? If you study Srila Prabhupada's life and you just study what he went through to even just get here, it's pretty eye-opening because it was certainly not comfortable. It was certainly not convenient. No one invited him. No one encouraged him. Not only that didn't, didn't encourage him, they discourage, tried to discourage him. And when he had already come, they didn't want to support him. And even though he had some success, he went back to India and um, was uh, criticized for uh, preaching to the low-class people in the West, and they, they didn't accept what he was doing. Okay, but he was following the direction of his spiritual master. You go to the West, he was told several times. And he said, if you ever get any money, print books. Okay, and that's what Srila Prabhupada did. So the process of Krishna consciousness, we, usually someone has to go and find a guru. Well, Srila Prabhupada is the guru, and he came to find us. Because we're so unfortunate, we don't even know we should get a spiritual master. Right? Why should I have a spiritual master? I got it all figured out. Right? Especially in a very rich country. We got everything we need. We don't need God, really. 
in the old days and when people would, you know, they needed their crops to grow or they needed some money. Oh, God, you know, and they go to church and they pray and, you know, and uh, and then when they get what they want, well, that, oh, that's, you know, hallelujah. But that's a, a that's okay. But unfortunately, if you pray for something, you don't get it. Like during World War II, some of the uh, wives of the soldiers would pray for their loved ones to come home. But unfortunately, many of them didn't come home. And so they be became uh, inimical. So how come if I'm praying to God, how come I don't get my loved one back? Okay. So there are many things that happen in our lives which appear to be inscrutable. But the truth is that we aren't really meant to be here. And there is a law of karma, action and reaction, that we all have to deal with. Someone's born with a silver spoon, somebody becomes a superstar, and someone with at least as much talent uh, goes nowhere. Why is that? There are many things which were very inscrutable. But the process of Krishna consciousness helps us to understand it. And that becomes like a salve. That's like, you know, why is something happening to me? But then if you, if you think about it, we've had many, many other lives. Okay? We are eternal. Our body isn't. And the Vedas tell us that we have had previous lives, that we've done a lot of things in many, many previous lives. Okay, so this, uh, our, <laughs> we call it a rap sheet, <laughs> things that we've done that we've forgotten about in some previous life, um, there's a reaction. And those reactions come as, sometimes it's like, you know, instant karma, right? Right away, you make some bad decision, you get caught, all right, go to jail or pay a fine, whatever. Okay, but you may have done something in a previous life, perhaps with someone uh, that you did wrong or someone did wrong to you. Okay? So you don't remember. And uh, I don't know about anyone here, but I, I've met people that I know I, I instantly. I, I, I see them, they see me, and like, we know each other. I, I don't know if you've had that experience, but I've had many times. Okay? I had some business dealings some years ago, and there was a big group of us, probably 20, 20 people, got completely cheated by this guy. Okay. And in that group of people, there was a guy named Larry, and I, I, he looked at me and I looked at him, and we knew each other. And so I'm convinced that somehow or this person who cheated all of us, somehow we were all in a cabal and, and took advantage of this guy. So he was... We're getting our just desserts, right? <laughs> so, life is inscrutable in that way. But if we understand why, if we understand who we really are, understand that, that we've lived before in, in other bodies and done different activities, then it's like, okay, okay, um, tough love, I, I deserve what I'm getting. In fact, the devotee is so humble that he thinks, I should get worse. I, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, to be where I am. There are many other people who are much less fortunate. And when you understand things, then it's more tolerable. It's more, it's like, okay, my mother passed away, but she's really not gone. She's an eternal being, okay? I love my mom, okay? I had to, you know, do the last rites and everything uh, for her, okay? But I know that she's still existing. And I, I remember going to the, to the the crematorium, and they have some ceremony. You put some sandalwood pulp or some, you know, scented oils and some garlands and so on. And I know, I know my mom was there, <laughs> and I know what she would say. You know, oh, heaven, for heaven's sake, you know. <laughs> and, and so, there are many things that, if you understand the, uh, uh, the spiritual science. Um, it makes life very joyful because now you can begin to see, not just look, you can begin to see what's actually happening. And I remember my first, uh, when I first bought Bhagavad Gita in 1971, I just read a few paragraphs and it's like, 
wow, this is really true. And then you go with in, in your life. You don't have to read Bhagavad Gita like a, like a novel or something like that. It's not a novel, but there's some story to it. But just read a few verses a day and then read the explanation, the purport. And it's like things all of a sudden, uh, the, the camera's lens is getting more and more focused. So now you can see things as they are. And that's a, it's a very j joyful process because we are naturally joyful. It's not natural to be unhappy. It's not natural to be bummed out, right? We are eternal. So there's, no, there's actually no such thing as death. Death simply means you change your body. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean that, well, yeah, you know, we'll call Dr. Kevorkian, <laughs> you know, I'll just, you know, step out of the scene. Uh, it's not quite like that. We have a body that we're given and we're like a lease. There's an end date, unfortunately. Okay, but while you're alive, try to do as much good as you can. What's the best good? Serving Krishna. That's the best good that you can do and encourage others to serve Krishna. That's what life is really all about. But if you can't serve Krishna directly and, and maybe you're still attached to doing uh, welfare activities, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with helping your neighbor. Nothing wrong with um, doing good to others, feeding the poor, and these sorts of things. Um, that's very good. It can be a stepping stone. Okay, you do pious activities, then you rise up uh, uh, in the world. Those who are in the mode of goodness go to the heavenly planets. Though if you look out in the sky at night, you see those stars, okay? According to the Vedas, they're planets, and people live there. And they have bodies that are suitable for the atmosphere. Just like on this planet, you have animals in the, in the water, okay? They're animals that fly in the air, some burrow under the ground, okay? And they have different types of bodies according to the, the atmosphere that they're in. In the Vedas it said there are people on the sun. How's that possible? Their bodies are made of fire. So there's no, they, you know, it's like if you have a watery body and you can live in the water. So if you have a fiery body, you can live in the fire. And the scientists have discovered um, near volcanoes where the, there's, the water is superheated because of the, the it's underwater, the, there's a lot of pressure. And there's some you know, small little animals that thrive. They're very happy to live there. So everywhere in the universe, there are bodies and there are people, okay, with different uh, uh, species, okay. In the Vedas, uh, they are des described some uh, kind of, I bet the eagles or something, they fly one planet to another. Wait till they discover that. <laughs> um, there are higher planets in the universe where those uh, inhabitants have mystic powers. They don't need a spaceship to go from one planet to the other. Okay? And sometimes you see, you know, uh, maybe watch some video or something, and you see someone actually flying through the air. I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen it. So, there are many things in the universe, okay, but within this world, okay, there's a difference between us and our body. That's the, that's the ABC. That's the, you know, one and one is two understanding. And it isn't so easy. Okay. I've been chanting Hare Krishna for 50 years. Um, I've still got a false ego as big as a house. <laughs> you know, I want to be, you know, recognized and eulogized and everything else, you know. But I've understood who's who. It's our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, when he was the spiritual master, he was a fire and brimstone. He could be fire and brimstone, especially to uh, in India, preaching to Indians, just lay it on it straight. But he could be as, as innocent as a child and as humble as, 
you can't imagine the depth of humility of Srila Prabhupada. He took the role of a spiritual master, but his humility stems from the fact that he could see Krishna at every moment. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I am an insignificant servant of Krishna. He always had that understanding. And I saw one time I was able to, uh, went to the Birlas. The, the Birlas is kind of in India, like those who are in, know India. The Birla family is some of the wealthiest in the, in, in the world. It's like having lunch with the Rockefellers or something, you know, very, very wealthy family. And sitting and speaking to the people there, he was just the perfect guest. Just, you know, he could make small talk like anything, you know, how are you, you know, you could inquire about things. But if someone asks a spiritual question, okay, it's kind of like Clark Kent takes off the, you know, <laughs> tears off his coat, it's like he's Superman. So the Prabhupada would instantly become spiritual master and he would he would preach so it was a perfect understanding of time and circumstance that was how Srila Prabhupada was so for those who are not disciples okay so you have to determine first of all if you're really serious not that I need a guru but just because well he says one and you know it's cool and you know wow well who's your guru oh my my guru is this you know it's not like a fashion it's like a fad you know it means you're serious about spiritual life, okay? So you have to be qualified, okay? If you want to learn something from somebody, and you go to somebody and ask them some question, and then once you get the answer, it's, well, I didn't, not, the, not the answer I really wanted. Maybe you don't say that, but you think it. Uh, well, you know, um, he's my spiritual master, but, you know, I, I'm, I can't accept what he says. Then why did you go to him in the first place? You have to become a qualified person to become a disciple. And then you have to decide yourself, within yourself, okay? You can ask others, but you have to decide within yourself, is this person qualified to be my spiritual master? Okay? Does he have the qualification? And we have to know what the qualifications are. You know, if this is a... I can say, well, this is, made, this is gold. But I don't know what gold is. What's that? I mean, you have to know what gold is if you're looking for gold. You have to know what a spiritual master is if you want a bona fide spiritual master. Okay. That means we have to know whether we're qualified, whether we're serious about it, or, okay, I'll just listen to what he says and, you know, I'll compare it to something else. And, um, you know, all I can say is, the guru is one. There's no two, it's not like this guru when I come opposed to this guru here. The guru always says the same thing. If someone contradicts, okay, then you can go to the Shastra. What, is the, what does the scripture say about it? Okay, you compare with the guru, Shastra, and Sadhu. Okay, if you want to know what a bona fide spiritual master is, then you have to know what the definition is. You have to understand what you're looking for. Okay? And if somebody says, I'm a spiritual master, but ask them who their spiritual master is, uh, well, um, <laughs> if they don't have a spiritual, bona fide spiritual master themselves, then they, they're not qualified. They might be great at motivating people. They might have lots and lots of followers, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions. That doesn't make any, any, any difference. Someone who is fully surrendered to Krishna, okay, will have symptoms. He'll, he'll be, uh, to be understood, self so what they call self-effulgent. You won't need to, like, have a committee declare and that the person has the symptoms. You see them yourself. So when Srila Prabhupada came, he, he was talking in the third person about a spiritual master, but then it's like, well, <laughs> you're like that. <laughs> you're you're the one we're talking about. But he was so humble he would never say, I, I'm the I'm the guru. Okay. Once you became initiated, once you accept that this person's my spiritual master, okay, then you have to be very careful 
because he might tell you something and it's your duty to accept it. Okay. Sometimes they say if you go into a dark room and you trip on a on a rope, right? And you might become scared. Oh no, I tripped I gotta you know run out of the room because I'm scared. Okay. Sometimes the spiritual master might say something that doesn't immediately make sense, but you have to accept it. But there's an explanation if you inquire. So if you, uh, if you have something that appears to be contradictory, you go to the spiritual master and you ask him, then he'll, he'll explain it. Okay, somewhere in, it says, well, there's a, uh, there's a village on the, on the water. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean it's in the water? No, no, it's on the, on the shore. That's a way of saying it. Okay, so sometimes a spiritual master might say, this world is dark. Well, what are you talking about? The, the, the sun is directly overhead. It might be, you know, standing on the equator. But he says, this world is dark. Because... And the explanation is that the universe is like a big football, okay? And the spiritual effulgence coming from the spiritual world does not shine into this world. It doesn't get beyond the coverings of the universe. So, in a sense, it's dark. So, this one day, the spiritual master says, this material world is dark. And then another day, he says, well, this spiritual world, you know, we are in... We are thinking we're in the material world. We're not actually in the material world. We're in the spiritual world. We are situated in the effulgence of God. So it's not dark. Hmm. Gosh, that's a contradiction. <laughs> but that's how we understand things. Sometimes there's a contradiction. We have the philosophy of chinta beta beta tattva. That we are simultaneously one with God and not one with God. We are separate. And that's what Bhagavad Gita Krishna explains. That all my parts and parcels are eternally separate. And there's a very popular philosophy going around nowadays that, oh, it's all one. You know, I'm God, but, you know, I forgot temporarily. And so I have to do meditation or, or do my sadhana. They use the same, same words. Um, and eventually... Uh, I won't need to worship God anymore because, well, I'm God. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> so that's our, that's our disease in the first place. So there are many, many pitfalls on the, on the way to, to pure spiritual realization. Okay? And so in the beginning, um, we have to have a little bit of faith and hear about Krishna, read the you know, books of Srila Prabhupada. And gradually, gradually, our misgivings are, are overcome. That's the process. Okay? And it may take many lifetimes. And there, there are some here who have been doing this for many lifetimes. And coming back, uh, take more steps and, and, and keep going. And some of us, um, it's brand new. But I can say, in this room, I'm going to say, Nearly 100% have had experience with Krishna consciousness in some form or time. Okay? Because you're all here and attentively listening and have some interest. Okay? So, um, I've lost track of time. So, it's 7 o'clock. Any questions or comments? Internet? Yes. Hare right, Krishna. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Prabhu, can I go ahead? Yes, go ahead. So Prabhu, you said that we should find a guru. Uh, so my question is that we cannot, we are, we are not supposed to trust our mind because our mind has all the past thoughts from previous life and it is not pure yet. So how do I trust my, my, my own mind to find a guru? How do you stop your, your mind? The the Hare Krishna mantra. No, no. How do I trust my trust. own mind trust to find mind. a guru? How, how do you trust your mind? In terms of finding a guru. Oh, oh, in terms of finding a guru. Yeah. Okay. First of all, you have to understand what a, what a guru is. 
who who is qualified to be a guru what are his what are his qualifications okay so it's not something that well I, that i have a qualification you know but if you're looking for like i say if you're looking for gold you have to know what the characteristics of gold are so if you want to find a, a spiritual master you have to find someone whose only business Prabhupada once told John Lennon, um, find someone who's addicted to Krishna. <laughs> that was his, his answer. How do I know that you know, someone's bona fide? So if someone has you know, information, you can accept his instruction. We call it a shiksha guru. You can take his instruction. He may not be on the highest platform, but he's a lot farther along than you may be. So you accept him to get instruction. Okay. So that's a Shiksha Guru. So we can also accept Sri the Prabhupada's teachings um, in, a, in a platform of, of having a Shiksha Guru. But if you don't find someone who, who has the symptoms of a pure devotee, find someone who's you know, very advanced, okay, you can accept instruction from him. But don't expect that he's going to be on a platform that he's not on. And, I, and that's... We are seeing the results of that. Um, unfortunately, in, in in our movement, some of the our so-called gurus had fallen away because they somehow were, for whatever reason, trying to be something that they weren't mature spiritually. Okay, so if you don't find someone, you don't necessarily need to be initiated by that person. So you could still be you know, looking for someone. And it's up to each individual to make that choice. Not that I, I say, well, he's, you know, he's the right one or he's the right one. I might have my opinion, and you can ask my opinion. But ultimately, you have to make your own choice. And that's very important. We have to have the sincerity and we have to have the seriousness to accept the right person, okay? If you're not completely sincere, you might find someone who's, you know, m maybe not mature. And and if we have some unrealistic expectation, we may be just disappointed. And that, unfortunately, has we've seen. So, did I answer your question? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you for your answer, Prabhu. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna. I, I, I hope I've made some progress. Yes. Prabhu, did you want to say? Go ahead. That was a great answer to his question. Because it is a very serious decision, it shouldn't be something taken for granted. Yeah. You're literally being liberated from a conditioning that we've had for lives after lives, and so it's a very serious matter. Yeah. And fortunately, we have Srila Prabhupada, who is a very serious spiritual master. Obviously, all that he sacrificed to give us Krishna consciousness in so many ways. And that leads into my question. Um, getting past that we're not this body, you spoke very eloquently today about how it's obvious because you saw some picture of you when you were a child. But you're still the same person. You're no longer that child body. So that was a great explanation. And then you spoke about how we have to get past how the mind is led astray and can be so distracting away from spiritual realization. And then beyond the mind, there's the intelligence. And above that is the ego. And in, of the ego, there's those two false and real ego. And our real ego is that we are in the image of God. We are a chinta veda veda tattva. We're simultaneously one with God, but we are immensely different in, qu in quantity, right. but we have the same qualities. So since in this age, one of those inconceivable forms of God is the sound vibration, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Could you elaborate, I know it's inconceivable, but could you elaborate on the mindset that will help us while we're chanting after the class is finished so that we can elevate our realization and taste 
what it is to really be spiritual and not material because that's who we really are. We are, by nature, spiritual, sat, right. eternal and <laughs> right. full of knowledge. Right. In other words, how do I get beyond my mind and ego and, and intelligence. Ego and all exactly. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada would say simply, with your mouth, make the vibration in your ear, you simply hear. It's, a, it's so disarmingly simple that we think it can't be that, it, it, that, that can't be it. We, had, it you know. we tend to overthink it. Yeah, we don't overthink <laughs> But it really is it. that yeah. simple. It, it really is that simple. The, the thing is, you'd say, you could say, it's like a child calling for its mother, right, in, in helplessness, okay? The humility, Trinata peace in Echina, you know, thinking oneself very humble and smaller than, you know, and, and helpless. It's kind of a contradiction because if you're trying to do something, like, a, you know, what I do, if I've got some, like I, I work on pianos, I'm a piano technician. So, you know, from my Christian days, I'll make a little sign of the cross. Help me, Krishna. Sometimes I, I might do something wrong or something, you know, catastro you know, catastrophic. Help me. And Srila Prabhupada had that humility, he had, you know, that he's going out to preach, but he's fully dependent on Krishna making things happen. We, we don't actually do anything. It was actually what I was trying to get my class on it. That we, we are not the doer. I think Barack Obama said, you know, you didn't do that. At least he got something right. We didn't do that because we're not actually doing anything. It's all being done externally through material nature. So the realization of how, how to chant and what, you, what we should be thinking is that, that Lord, I, I am your servant. Please engage me in your service. That's what the meaning of the mantra how, you know, please engage me in, in your service. Oh Lord, oh energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. And Krishna is right with us. He's sitting right next to us. We don't perceive him. But he's right there. So he knows your sincerity. Okay? And all right, so we've got all kinds of material desires and empty things on our mind. What am I going to do, you know, tomorrow? You know, I have to go to work or whatever it is. Okay? But calming the mind... It's simply chanting the mantra and hearing, hearing the sound. And it, again, it's disarmingly simple, but that's actually what it is. It, it, it's, it's a mind deliverance mantra, right? The maha mantra, the, the, the greatest deliverance is the holy name. And actually cut everything out. The only thing is the holy name. That's it. We have all these books to understand all these things. Why we should chant? Okay, Lord Chaitanya came to give us the Maha Mantra, right? Lord Chaitanya's guru told him, "You, I understand." Lord Chaitanya was a scholar, and his guru told him, "You're a fool. You can't study anything. You just chant Hare Krishna." <laughs> okay, he could have said, "Well, who are you? I'm God." <laughs> you know, he's that. You know, why? Why should I follow <laughs> what he said? But Lord Chaitanya started chanting Hare Krishna and he became mad. He couldn't help it. He said, I can't help it. I, I just, I, I chanted and automatically these things happen. Automatically, I, I feel this ecstasy automatically. Right? So there's no, there's no mental activity to really understand all of this. It's beyond, it's beyond our mind. It's coming down from the spiritual world. So that's the, the, the nature of it. It's disarmingly simple. But we want to make everything complicated. <laughs> you know, do some yoga or, you know, whatever it is. Okay. So, Srila Prabhupada, being very, very uh, uh, merciful to us, has given us all kinds of things to do, all kinds of activities to engage our senses. Because when you engage your senses in serving Krishna, that activity is spiritual, fully spiritual. Okay, look at Arjun. Arjun's a warrior, right? Krishna tells Arjun, I want you to fight. What? The, the ultimate, you know, if you're godly, you're supposed to be like gentle and, and, and nice. And Arjun was. So I don't want to fight this fight. I'd rather, you know, go to the forest. 
And Krishna said, no, I want you to fight. That was his, that was his occupation. But he was thinking, I'm going to go up to the forest and meditate or do something else. I don't want to kill my, my, my friends and my teachers and my grandfather and, and everybody. Why is Krishna, you know, saying that? Why, why is God, who's supposed to be the, you know, the ultimate nice guy, why is he encouraging Arjuna to fight and kill people? Okay? There was a purpose. And Arjuna did what Krishna asked. Krishna, uh, I mean, Arjuna surrendered to Krishna. Krishna was the, taking the role of a spiritual master. And it, when Arjuna was saying, uh, you know, I shouldn't fight because of this reason and that reason, Krishna said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, Arjuna? You, you know, you're speaking big, big words, but what you're saying is ridiculous. Not an old learned man would talk like that. You're a fool. Okay, so what did Arjuna do in the end? He fought. That was his duty. Okay, and when, when we read Bhagavad Gita, it's not, not so much about duty. It's about doing things for Krishna, dedicating our activities to Krishna. Okay, if I'm doing some business, I give some profit to Krishna. And I tell my friends about Krishna. Okay, whatever it is, it has to be connected to Krishna. That's devotional service. And if you do it, then you feel connected. Right? This is right. I feel that I belong here. Okay? I remember coming to the temple, I'll, be, I'll end in a second, but I remember coming to the temple and feeling very strange because all these weird people were, you know, doing things I couldn't fathom. But in, in myself, I felt at home. I, I can't tell you why. I didn't like the hairstyle, I didn't want to cut my hair, didn't want to wear robes, but I felt somehow at home. Okay? This is our real home, okay? And your home can be home too, if you put Krishna in your home. Simply, uh, you can take a picture of Lord Chaitanya or Krishna, make a little altar, offer your food to Krishna, read the Bhagavad Gita and other books. You have Krishna. <laughs> and you come to the temple, that's where we, we get association, we become strong. So. Anything else? I think that's it. Another thank question. you, thank you.